And uh, Kristen Thompson, Gene Cook, Peter DeCola really knocked it out of the park with uh, a project that we had that we started in 2010 uh, into artist revenue streams. And this research pro uh, project, which you may be familiar with, it lives at money.futureofmusic.org. Again, that's money.futureofmusic.org. Tons of information about how musicians' revenue streams are changing in this new music landscape. Uh, this multi-stage uh, project collected a ton of data about musician and composer revenue streams as a percentage of income across 42 separate revenue streams that are available to musicians in today's environment. Uh, at previous summits, we've had presentations on what some of that data means, and we, we keep all that stuff archived on our site, on Vimeo, on YouTube, et cetera, if you want to take a look. Uh, today, we're going to do something a little bit different by pairing a true music industry veteran with someone whose job it is to distribute revenue to artists. Sonny Charles is an acclaimed soul singer who has worked in the industry for 50 years and has a longer view than most folks when it comes to making money from music. And Dennis Dreeth from the AFM and SAG-AFTRA Intellectual Property Rights Distribution Fund. Now that would be the longest acronym in the world if you spelled it out, I think. You'd need like a you know, subway car for that. Uh, Dennis has, uh, really understands the challenges of getting musicians paid in a timely and transparent manner. So please join me in welcoming them to the stage. First of all, wow, what a hard act to follow. Uh, I know. I'd just love to hear it one more time for the Civil War players. Were those kids amazing <laughs> or what? Right. You know? That's right. So, so uh, anyway, we, uh, I'm here with Sonny. This is uh, really a, a, great, uh, a great joy for me. Uh, Sonny and I actually go back, uh, actually, a large part of his 50 years. 30, <laughs> 30 plus years uh, yeah. we've, we've known each other. We've collaborated on, a, on some stuff, you know, so, yes, yeah, so, it's nice being here with Dennis. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting, I, and I know we have a little script to go through, but uh, I, if you'll indulge us a little bit, uh, you know, uh, it's a little bit of a reunion for Sonny and, and me, I, I just think that, you know, and, and I know that you want to get to the script part of it, but I just want to say that actually it's, you know, give you an idea of how things have changed. Well, Sonny and I worked together for more than 30 years. Well, actually, we are, our first meeting goes back even much later, or much earlier than that, yeah. uh, when uh, not too long after Sonny's first record, Black Pearl, uh, was a chart chart busting record. Um, the Checkmates had a, had a record company for a while, and one of my very first uh, sessions as a professional musician uh, playing saxophone uh, was when I got a call to uh, come to a Hollywood studio a little after midnight and uh, play on a Checkmates date. So, right. so we really go back uh, way, way, way to our youth. So I guess that kind of opens it up by saying there's been a lot that's changed uh, over the years, and I think you know if we look at the first chart here, oh. we can actually even see. Um, you know, like Sonny. Uh, is, is that me? That, that's you, Sonny. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think the, the the first question is that obviously a lot's changed. Um, Sonny's career has been um, a great deal as a performing musician. He's one of the one of the people who I think in the earlier days made uh, you know a real career as, as a live performance. Live uh, live performances. We were um, my group was called the Checkmates. We were a um, Las Vegas. Uh, performance band. We were a high, high energy band and uh, we played uh, starting in the early 60s, early 1960s for some of you all who don't get the... But anyway, uh, we started back in those days doing, uh, doing shows and, and didn't really put much emphasis on recording. Uh, mainly we were making our, our money from performing live. We opened for Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis Jr. We did uh, uh, several uh, several performances like that. And uh, later it evolved into us getting uh, a lot of television. Uh, there were just a ton of variety shows back in the 60s and, and 70s. And uh, along with doing the Dick Clark stuff and all of those uh, things that were related, you know, Dick Clark and Soul Train and all those things that came later. But back in the days when we did Ed Sullivan and Mike Douglas and Merv Griffin and all of those shows that happened throughout the 60s, it was a big part of our revenue stream. 
you know, we were getting paid uh, quite handsomely to do those shows. And, but those shows no longer exist, uh, not in the same volume that they did back in those days. So I don't know, everything has changed. Maybe I'm just rushing too far on this, but everything has sort of changed as far as uh, how I make money. I make money by performing. And uh, being with the Steve Miller Band now, uh, I'm still doing it that way, you know, after, uh, actually it's been 58 years, but uh, it's been fun. Which is amazing, because Sonny's only 57 years old, so. <laughs> Do I show it? <laughs> well, I think that, that's a good segue, because I think the, the, the point is that, um, that while you're still doing things pretty much the same way you've always done them, mm -hmm. um, you know, what's really changed? If we look here, you can see that in uh, the early days, uh, that probably from TV, movie appearances, 20% uh, of your income has really come about through that. Yeah. But there's also a lot of uh, money that did come. Uh, the recording was an adjunct, but it was also a way it did it supported the live tours. It really added, yes. uh, probably without the recordings, that was, uh, recordings had to be a factor that drove audiences to. The way it was presented to me as a, as a youngster in my 20s, just getting out of the military, uh, starting my career, um, signing the first radio, um, radio, Signed the first record contract with, uh, I believe our first contract was with Liberty Records. Um, I don't even know if they exist anymore, but anyway, it was told to us, listen, you record, recording is, is like, uh, is more or less like marketing. You don't make any money recording. Your money is going to be made uh, out on the, uh, out on the uh, stages. So consequently, we signed off all of our publishing. We signed off the writing. We didn't know, you know what I mean? coming from a very unsophisticated, uh, unsophisticated background. So we signed it all away. But the thing about it was, uh, that's just the way it was back in those days. We didn't really know. Uh, in those days, do you think that it was maybe different today that, uh, that there people sort of took care of artists in a different way? Maybe they took care of them in a bad way, yeah. but you had people to sort of watch out for you, that people took care of, managed a lot of those things, where in today's climate, I think the artist has to be much more responsible for themselves. And, and is that Absolutely. true? And is that fair? Absolutely, it's, it's true. And I guess it is fair because that's the way it is. Uh, the, the thing about it is that, uh, I guess with people like, like yourselves, uh, maybe you can help uh, young artists coming along, although young artists have been my experience, don't listen anyway. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, they got their own ideas of what's going on. But the, maybe if somebody had pulled me, to, uh, pulled me off to the side, such as uh, later on in my life when I ran into Sammy Davis and Frank Sinatra and those people who would sit down for five or six minutes and give you just a little tidbit of stuff to do and how to look at show business and realize that business is the bigger word. It show is a small word. Uh, didn't know that. So once, once you learn that, then you start looking at, the, at what's actually going on and that you start protecting your intellectual property and making sure that you get, uh, you know, what's coming to you. And uh, so it's a learning process. And, and oddly enough, it's not really taught in any situations. I hope this, this uh, the arts thing that's happening in school will touch on that situation also. Maybe we should take a, a fast forward and look at uh, sort of the same economic picture from today's standard, and which we have right here. So if we look now, what comes is like 97% of your income comes from live performance, yes. which in, in, interestingly is probably pretty much the same way you've done live performance all these years. That hasn't changed much. Fortunately for me, I've managed to, uh, you know, in this business, you have to continually reinvent yourself. And I've managed to do that for 58 years. Right now, I started off as singing doo-wop, and right now I'm doing classic rock. And uh, in the meantime, I've done everything from jazz singer to R&B singer to, to whatever. Um, I tried acting and didn't work. <laughs> but you know what, you, you, you just keep trying stuff, you know, and the thing about it is right now, as far as recording, you don't see many uh, artists of my age group recording anymore. Record companies are not interested because there's no way to market us. Well, that's, at least that's what I was told. 
Well, I think that's a good point, but uh, whether uh, as a solo artist, but you continue to do a lot of other work for other artists. You, you oh, still yeah. continue to sing background vocals for people and work on other people's records because that's, in some ways, is a little bit of an uh, anonymous, but it's a skill that you've honed over all these years. Well, that's, that's what I was saying. You know, you learn to do whatever, you know, that you can to keep yourself going in this, you know, and as far as doing backgrounds or doing lead, um, I tell people over and over again when they say, well, what about doing country music? I say, I don't care, it's just notes. You know, if you know the story and you, and you tell the story with, with your voice, then it doesn't really matter if you're doing background or if you're doing uh, whatever, whatever genre there is. So since the portion of your income has changed a great deal from recorded music to live performance, uh, and it really was always sort of pushed in that area, but maybe what can you say about how the recording process, how the, the process of making records, how do you see that has changed you know, over the years? How is that different now than when, than when we started? From that first day uh, that I met you in the studio when I was 19 yeah. playing on, 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 you know, on a record uh, for you guys, how, how has the business changed? How is the process different? My first recording experience, we were at a radio station in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and we recorded directly onto vinyl to show you how far that, I don't look that old, do I? But anyway. <laughs> We recorded we directly you, on vinyl. At least it wasn't under wire. Yeah, we were yeah. not yes. quite that far. That far yes, back. but uh, then as, it, as it's gone on, my last recording I did a couple of years ago, I, I did a CD in a guy's house. You know, uh, so now, you know, the recording industry is not really just all about studios anymore. It's about home studios. Most, most of the people I know are doing stuff when three or four people are making CDs now as opposed to having full... Uh, bands and orchestras and, and all that sort of thing happening. I wish that that sort of stuff was still happening more because I enjoy working with other musicians more than I do just trying to create it myself. Uh, but, you know, that's pretty much where the industry is from what I see. With that, what happens is uh, back in, in the days, you know, when, when we were doing this as, as young guys, people were all together. It was easier to gather information now, how do you feel, there's a, is there a more of a responsibility now for you to be kind of responsible for letting people know when you do something? Because if, you, if, if I don't know, for example, you sang on, on backgrounds and you've done that in somebody's uh, you know, home studio, uh, whoever knows where, um, and I don't know about it, well, what happens with that if I don't know about it? Yeah, you know, a lot of situations, I talk to guys and they, uh, or not just guys, but talk to people who are, who are recording and... Uh, they might bring in other people to, to help them, but you know, if you do a single and you put it on, on iTunes, you don't include all the people that help you do it. If you do a CD, then you can do liner notes and all that kind of stuff and everybody will know who was involved in it. But most of the time, you know, you're just releasing, releasing CDs now is not really profitable because everything is downloaded. So it seems that uh, it's, it's my experience that you do singles and you put them on iTunes and, and you get your downloads from that, there's no information that goes with that. So would, would it be safe to say that you feel it's incumbent upon any kind of artist, a background singer, a non-featured performer, anybody who's working on a record to somehow, you know, one, keep track of it mm -hmm. uh, and to try to at least let people know that it's you on that record? Yes. Yes, and that's, that's the whole uh, thing. You know, fortunately, uh, people can go to Sonny Charles and and on iTunes and they can find stuff that I've recorded. But uh, if, if it's a person that, if they don't go looking for me, they won't find me. You know, and uh, so, you know, I don't know. I think the self-promotion thing is, is sort of new to a lot of us. You know, I'm, I was always used to having other people do the promotion. But now it's a big part of anything that you do as, a, as an artist. You've got to make sure that you promote yourself in a way where you can sell. I think this really uh, underscores the big problem that I have is that when somebody like Sonny is recording on a background part for somebody, uh, ultimately we need to be responsible to pay those people for their non-featured roles. And so it's getting harder and harder for us to find people. So I think that uh, the whole discussion about metadata that we've been having here, this is uh, in all the future music conferences I've been to uh, this has probably been the most focused on metadata. And while it may seem to be a boring subject, I think uh, 
it, the, the topic may be boring, but, uh, but getting paid is, is never a boring topic. So maybe with that, I know we're running out of time, but maybe we should open it up and see if there's any questions. Uh, anybody has a, a question they'd like to ask? And Yeah, over here. There should be a mic someplace. Here, you can use mine. Oh, no, there's one right here. There we go. Meet you halfway. I just, want, I just want to clarify something. My name is Debbie Newman, and I deal with a lot of the digital music licensing to startups um, who are paying through Sound Exchange. And so a portion of the Sound Exchange revenue that's collected, 50% goes to the featured performing artist, 45% um, goes to the featured performing artist, 50% goes to the record label, and 5% or thereabouts goes into this pool, which then pays for the side musicians, you know, anybody else who record on the record, exactly the people you're talking about. So one of the things you are talking about is the metadata in the s digital sound recording. If those musicians aren't in there, then you don't know that they've actually played on the right. recording. Um, but how does that 45, I mean, that 5% actually get uh, divvied up to all the hundreds or thousands of musicians who are the side musicians on these recordings for Sound Exchange and iHeartRadio and Sirius XM and all the services that are paying through Sound Exchange under the uh, DMCA? This is a great question and, and uh, you know I'm sorry that the answer is not an easy one but I'll be happy to tell it and it is thousands uh, it's uh, we distribute um, literally millions of dollars uh, each distribution and we have our distributions uh, reach as many on each distribution as, as many as 20,000 performers. Um, what Sound Exchange does is they actually have the featured artists, so they have a, a playlist uh, that can have you know 100,000 sound recordings on it, and everybody on that list will get their, their money. It goes down to a very small amount of money, so some of the featured artists are making uh, you know three or four dollars per distribution. Uh, obviously, that's not feasible on the uh, non-featured performers, uh, I'll give you an example. The very first uh, distribution we saw from Sound Exchange, well, our money flows through Sound Exchange, comes through the various subscription services, the Sound Exchange, Sound Exchange forwards the, our 5% to us, and we distribute it. Um, we got $187,000 for our first distribution, which sounds not so bad until you look at the uh, data, and we had 500,000 discrete sound recordings upon which to divvy up uh, $187,000. So it I doesn't take much of, a, of an accountant to say that doesn't work too well. And so what happened, we had to generate um, a series of sort of proxies or playlists. So we would actually go down the top uh, uh, categories and we would pay on the top, you know, uh, uh, we use what's called uh, frequency reports. These are reports that are how often something has been uh, streamed, uh, uh, webcasting, uh, what kind of hits they've had, the frequency of a subscription service. So those generate reports of their activity. And then we basically pull the top recordings down to the point where we try not to distribute uh, anything less than a $10 amount or a de minimis amount per performer. And that gets us down any distribution. Um, we can get as far down as about 20,000 recordings uh, sometimes, depending on the pool of money that comes in. So then it means we have to go and take a look at every sound recording. What we get is we get the name of the artist and the sound recording. That's all the information that we have. And we have to identify each and every performer. Uh, and not just you know the drummer, the bass player, or the background vocalist. If there's a string section, and it's, let's say there's a 25 string players, we have to find every violinist, violist, and cellist on, on that recording. Um, so it's a huge research task, and that's, uh, and that's basically what, what we do, and that's how, how it goes. Uh, you can go to the fund's website, and you can look at it as www.afmsagafterafund.org, uh, one of the world's longest URLs. Uh, I'm sorry about that, but when you have an organization that has union trustees, they like to put long names in this. But... Uh, and you can look at a list of covered sound recordings to see how we've arrived at them and which, which recordings are covered. So I'm sorry for such a long answer, but it's a complicated topic. I think we have another question uh, over here. I'm sorry. Um, one point you mentioned was that in order to, to maintain your previous revenue streams, you started producing singles instead of albums. Yes. And I think that's a growing trend today. And I was wondering what you thought and how that affected the music industry now that artists are really producing to make, to make money on singles instead of albums. Well, the thing about it that I've that I, I've experienced, if I if I produce my own uh, single and I 
put it out on iTunes or however I sell it at, at live or whatever it is, I get 100% of the money. You know what I mean? So that changes the whole dynamic of, of, of recording rather than going through all of the uh, traditional ways. When, uh, I mean, I recorded a, a, a song for A&M Records with Phil Spector, by all people, and I ended up making $1,000. The song was number six. It has sold probably a million now. It's been re-released four times. I only made $1,000. So now, uh, being in control of my product has, I mean, it makes a big difference. You know, you just have to figure out how to market it. That's a big problem. Thanks. I hope that helps. <laughs> a question over here. Um, so I guess this panel is kind of about like models for funding oneself, right, as a musician. and. This might be a little bit out there, but yesterday I was talking to, I had a show and I opened for this other band and they were talking about how they had this one benefactor that was kind of, you know, funding all this, like private benefactor that was funding all this stuff. And it got me thinking a little bit more about like, I guess I just want to hear your opinion about this proposed model, which is uh, instead of, instead of, instead of kind of where, you pool money kind of like in a foundation and then you give grants, but like maybe moving to do that so that people can have, I don't know, just as a different way of, I know that that exists, like the DC, the Commission on Arts and Humanities gives grants out and stuff like that, but what if we as musicians started moving towards that model or started looking for like people who want to support the arts and want to make sure that people are living and not just by buying our CDs, but actually by like contributing to a foundation that then like grants out money that people can use. I don't know, this is, it's just an idea that I just had. It might be a little too crazy, but I, I just wonder. Well, you know, I think uh, if you look at it, uh, you know, sort of everything is old is new again. And, uh, you, know, you know, centuries ago, you know, artists, you know, existed almost entirely on patrons yeah. of the arts. Yeah. They didn't, uh, and, you know, it was monetized in a totally different way. So I'm, I think whatever happens, I, you know, I, what I do know after all these years in the business is that I don't know what's going to happen next. That, that's the one thing I can tell you that I absolutely can guarantee and one thing I know. Um, so whatever model works, and I think that people have to find their own way, and I think that's the whole point of this is, is to find ways that work for you monetize those and use those not just as a you know as a an end to them and use it to it basically as endo means find a way to, to use that to springboard uh, to to a bigger audience to to a, to you know to tra change the way you create the way you deliver product um, I, that's what I see is we're going to see a lot of that so I, I don't uh, I don't dismiss anything that provides artists uh, a source of funding and uh, something that supports the creative process I think it, it's all good. Does anything big like that exist already? Like, not not through like government stuff, but like, um, like private foundations. I don't I don't think so. Especially if you're trying to do it on a professional level. I think more for amateur level, more like uh, for for uh, uh, community projects, right. you might find it. But for say, like if you got a band and you're trying to make a career out of it, it's tough to find uh, like that source. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. You, know, was, was, you just have to find an angel somewhere. I think we have time for one more question. We're actually out of time, but we'll take one more question here. So Thank you. you guys can flip a coin. Yeah. Hey, Mr. Sonny, um, first off, I just say I, I so respect you for what you have done and accomplished over the years. This is absolutely incredible just to be able to see um, that you are actually outdoing so many artists that are even here today. Um, they have not had that opportunity um, or the privilege to even, you know, have the blessings that you have to be able to be performing um, clearly much more than you were in the past, and you just continue to excel. So my question is, what is Wait, the... would you like to join my band? I would love to. I would love to. <laughs> my question, um, as a young artist, I've been doing it for seven years, and I've had the opportunity to travel um, you know, God has blessed me, so I do get paid for my shows, but I always like to get information from those who have, you know, come before me. So is there a key, and what is the key, if so, um, to a great live performance that keeps your crowd engaged, that keeps them coming to see you um, after all of these years? I think the best, the best advice I can give for anybody who wants to get the most out of their performance is, number one, when you're t 
when you walk out on stage, you've got to realize that most people in the audience want to like you. So be yourself. Let yourself go. Don't feel like people come there to judge you. People come there to like you. They wouldn't spend money if they didn't. So just relax. Be true to yourself. Don't, don't uh, put too much emphasis on trying to do something you think people will like. Do what comes from here. And that's, that's the stuff that uh, translates to just about every audience. I don't care if they don't even speak your language. Wow. Thank you. That, that job offer is still open. <laughs> okay. Thank you.